Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. You welcome back. How have you been? I'm, I'm very good, George. How are you? Good. Looking forward to this. How did you get interested in these megaliths? Well, that actually came through uh, crop circles, actually, uh, way, way back, you know, 20, 25 years ago, because they kept turning up. And um, it kind of drew me into the megalithic landscape in Wiltshire and Cornwall and other places. And, uh, yeah, I became hooked, became a megalithomaniac, and that was that. What did you conclude about crop formations? Those things amaze me. They do, and they keep coming as well. Um, they're still coming. There was plenty this year. There's like 25 or so this year. Um, but, yeah, they're fascinating. And the interesting thing about them is that they're located so close to these stone circles and megaliths and ancient earthworks and long barrows and everything else. And they even encode similar geometries and measurements as you get in the stone circles. So... Yeah, they're pretty amazing, um, uh, but you know, and they go back as well, just like the megaliths do. There's a prehistory of them. Do you think they're ET created? Could well be. I mean, some of them are, uh, are difficult to explain. There's lots of sightings associated with them. So um, who knows? I used to tell researchers that if you had a hundred crop formations and ninety nine of them were made by man, there's the one you can't explain. That's the story. Yeah, no, no, you're right, yeah, that's it. I mean, even if a tiny percentage can't be explained, and, and you still have that today even, it's quite strange. I mean, um, you know, people kind of tend to know who makes uh, ones, but actually there's still some of them that are still very much unexplained. You wrote uh, a book called Gobekli Tepe and Ketahan Tepe, the world's first megaliths. Let's talk about each site, first of all, where they are and what they are, in your opinion. Go ahead with Gobekli Tepe. Yeah, Gobekli Tepe has become, you know, one of the main sites in Turkey to visit. This dates back to 11,600 years ago. This is the dating they're getting now. And they found a whole bunch of circular, oval or elliptical shaped um, sort of like stone circles. But the, the you know, the, the pillars are beautifully carved T-shaped pillars. Then you have two giant ones in the middle as well. And much of this is like carved out of limestone, beautiful relief carvings on it. And they've excavated about what, 5 to 10% of the site. So they've got about five or six of these so-called stone circles already excavated. But there's up to about 15 more um, that haven't yet been excavated. This is just one site. And what they found there is, is really quite remarkable. There's, there's new discoveries still being made there. And because the site uh, appeared to have been deliberately covered over, hmm. then, um, it's hard to kind of excavate. You've got to remove all this rubble and stone. But there, there's geometries coming out of them. There's specific measurement systems. There's um, remarkable alignments and very abstract artistic design in 3D relief on these stones. Now, People weren't supposed to be doing this back then. It right. wasn't supposed right. to be happening until Egypt, like six or 7,000 years later. Um, and so you've got to imagine, you know, we're talking about like 20 stone hinges in one site. Now they think there's at least 12 of these sites in total, possibly even more. Um, and so Gobekli Tepe is really just the tip of the iceberg. Does it look like the stones were moved or carved in place? In at Gobekli Tepe, they've got they found the quarry site nearby, about half a mile away. So they were carving them on the kind of plateau they're on, which is near Shanlurfa, in southeast Turkey, um, in the anti taurus Mountains. And so they they know they were relatively local, but they still had to carve them out of solid rock and move them over and move them over. Some of them was, we're talking like between five and ten tons at least. Um, some of them could be could weigh more. They're, they're now finding bigger and bigger 
stones like we're seeing at Carahan Tepe, for instance. And, yeah, it does, you know, it just shouldn't have been happening at this time. Because even this sophistication isn't really evident in the stone circles of Britain some 7,000 years later. And so, you know, where did that, you know, where did these ideas, this innovation, this style come from? By looking at it, Hugh, what would you say its purpose is? When it comes to Gebekli Tepe, uh, they, I think it's multiple purpose. I think is as Klaus Schmidt, who was the original German archaeologist who kind of discovered the site in the mid-90s, he said for a long time these were like temples. And this is now being changed by the new archaeologists that have come in. So unfortunately, Klaus Schmidt died a few years ago. And they're now claiming it's a kind of domestic dwelling uh, where people were starting to live, where hunter-gatherers started to kind of settle and start to grow food and things like this. But to me, when you look at the site, you can see these are highly decorated, ritualistic, almost shamanic sites. They're not just for people to hang out in or live there. This is something else. So definitely a ceremonial aspect to it. But also, all the symbols seem to point to astronomy and even astrology in some cases. So it could have been an observatory could also have been a place where pilgrims would go. It could be a memory space where they're holding all the knowledge of their culture in one place. And I think it was an innovation and teaching center, almost like a uni- the first university. So it all, it, all this adds up to something quite remarkable. Are there doorways, Hugh, where people can go into some place? Well, the strange thing about Gebegli Tepe is, is that there's no clear, apart from a couple of the enclosures, there's no clear entrances. They're kind of almost like being blocked up with walls. Yet some people have suggested they may have had roofs. That's one of the theories. So people would have gone through the roofs, through these hold stones that were part of the mm. constructed roof. But on in, in enclosure D and enclosure C, there does appear to be entrances coming in from the south. Uh, that, that got changed over time, as though they're kind of um, kind of entering from the south, looking north, as they approach the kind of centre of these enclosures. So it's, it's, they may have climbed down steps is another option. That's why they can't explain why well, there's no clear doorways at ground level. But yeah, but certainly there's um, there's different theories about that for sure. Is the structure hollow or is it solid? Well, most of the what's been excavated at Gebekli Tepe is, um, is uh, located on the bedrock. So the structures are built upon a layer of bedrock, and then they kind of place the stones, insert them in sockets and things like this, and balance them in place somehow. Um, and but some of the structures, the later structures, they actually cover over the earlier enclosures, earlier kind of stone circles, and then build upon that. So they build upon the mound they've covered it up with. And so there's lots of rebuilding, reconstructing, reorienting, I think, as well, when it comes to the astronomy and astrology. And so, yeah, I think there's um, quite a lot going on there. And these were in use for, you know, a couple of thousand years before they were kind of covered over and completely forgotten about for about 10,000 years. Wow, that's amazing. Let's move over to uh, Kerahan Tepe. Where is that? Kerahan Tepe is located 23 miles or about 37 kilometers southeast of Gebekli Tepe. It's in the Tektek Mountains. This is limestone mountains, but when you drive through there, you really feel like you're in the middle of nowhere. It's like a marsh landscape. And Kerahan Tepe... Um, uh, that's, that's a modern name given to it in 1997 by Bahatin Selik, a local archaeologist. It used to be called Ketchley Tepe, K-E-C-E-L-I, and Tepe. And this is still the name of a local area. And um, this is, again, this has only recently been excavated since late 2019. Now, I've been visiting the site along with Andrew Collins and J.J. Ainsworth since uh, 2014, before it was excavated. And all you could see there, which is pretty weird, is just the tops of these T-shaped pillars popping out of the ground because it had been covered over, remember, like all these sites have. And so, and we always wondered what was going to be discovered there. But then when they did start excavating and what did come out of the ground when it was eventually announced in a uh, the 2021 is absolutely mind-blowing and it really is on par and similar uh, to Gebekli Tepe and yet here they appear 
it's carved directly out of the bedrock in many cases. We have kind of kind of subterranean chambers with pillars, you know, carved directly out of the bedrock. We have protruding heads coming out of walls, and um, and even some of the T pillars and benches on the western edge of the main enclosure, anyway, at Carahan Tepe, is carved out of bedrock, whereas the rest of the enclosure is freestanding T pillars. So it's a very sophisticated site, um, and they're realizing now, especially with new discoveries that have come out, that it's much bigger, even bigger than Gebekli Tepe, and this is just one of the other sites. How deep were they uh, covered up? They covered up. I mean, when you were, we were visiting Karan Tepe, you know, since 2014, before it was excavated, it was covered up to the tops of the T pillars. Basically, it, was, it would have been completely covered over. How many feet might that have been? That's you, you're probably talking um, between seven and twelve feet. Wow, maybe more in some cases because some of these T pillars um, are now we're thinking they could be up to like um, at least maybe fifteen to. 18 feet tall at Karahan Tepe. Jeez. So it could have been even more. They could have had layers on, but over time, you know, thousands of years, it kind of the tops get, you know, the wind and the weather kind of blows off the top layers, so things start to get exposed. And so, yeah, so that Karahan Tepe is really where it's happening now. This is where all the new discoveries are coming out. And, you know, I think one of the most important things there is what's called the Pillar Shrine or Structure AB. And this is Cut. It's like six by seven meters um, wide, um, so twenty odd feet. You know, it's the shape of a kind of egg, and it's cut down into the ground, directly into the bedrock. But they've left these kind of phallic-shaped monoliths carved out of bedrock, um, coming out of the ground, which is utterly unique in the area, and it kind of blew people away when it was first discovered. And um, since then, more discoveries and the importance of that. Uh, is now coming to light. Hugh, do you think these structures were buried on purpose or were they buried by weathering? They were buried on purpose for sure because you can see, you can see this you know, most of the sites now that they were uh, repairing the sites, really. They were repairing them because they must have got damaged and then, then kind of burying them really carefully so all the stones upright in situ they were placing kind of artifacts these polished stone plates for instance on some of the benches between the t-pillars um so they were definitely covered over in fact the archaeologist neshmi Karal, who's running the excavation at karahan tepe and gebekli tepe now he may, he wrote a paper about this and you can clearly see that at gebekli tepe as well i mean it's completely completely covered up and just that alone we're talking thousands of tons of earth and debris and stone being moved into place to kind of um, uh, to do that job. You know, so you've got the construction of it, you use it for a couple of thousand years, you repair it, and then you bury it. So altogether, the amount of work, and there must have been hundreds of people involved in this. Why bury it? Was it were they burying it to hide it or for some other reason? That, that's a good question. That's what people are kind of confused about, to be honest with you. Um, because they don't really know. I mean, they they found that some of the site at Karahan Tepe, for instance, had been deliberately damaged, like, kind of smashed up, and then it was buried. You know, and it's like, hang on a sec. Mm-hmm. So, is this a symbol of them kind of wanting to close down the site, like decommission it somehow? Yeah, something might have happened. Yeah, then they move on to maybe other areas. Maybe something was happening. They they had felt like they had to move from that area. Um, why that is, we don't, we don't know, but we know that, you know, there were incoming, you know, different people coming in from different areas. There could have been trouble in the area. It could have been to do with the climate. It could have been to do with trouble growing food. Cause it's now known that agriculture developed just after the construction of Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe, the whole Neolithic revolution, if you like. Um, and so, yeah, so we have to um, we have to consider that as a possibility. Could they have been sacred sites, and for some reason they decided to do away with them? Yeah, I mean, it could have been other people coming in and, like, just wanted to destroy them, you know, things like this. But the fact that, you know, I think they were very much sacred sites. I think they were observatories, they were sacred sites. 
Um, and maybe they just yeah, had used them for what they needed to use them for, and they moved on to other areas, and they would build other sites in different places. This could be the case. There's definitely stories of migration and uh, evidence of that now. Um, but the fact that, you know, they were observatories, maybe they, you know, the stars and the planets and the sun and the moon had moved from where they wanted it to be after, the, you know, they, so they, they're done with it, and they moved on to somewhere else. That's uh, one of the ideas. Jeez. Were they buried in sand, Hugh, or just dirt? Well, it's a bit of both. I think they, they used the local materials like rock, rubble, um, different soils. There's even evidence in the pillar shrine where these kind of 11 pillars sticking up out of the ground with the, the head sticking out of the wall, um, that they kind of layered it really carefully and then at the very top. They put kind of flagstones, like large flat stones, to kind of cover it over to, as like a final layer, if you like, um, and, and kind of preserve what was in there. And there's, they, have, they have found possibly stuff, possibly materials from different areas, like people are coming in from different parts of the country even. So, that's, um, so it may have been a very special pilgrimage place when it was in use. In terms of widespreadness, how big would it be if you were looking at it from above? Karan Tepe stretches at least for a mile, I would say. A couple wow. A couple of kilometers if you stretched it across the landscape. Because you've got, you got stuff going on on different hills. Like to the north, you've got Ketchley Tepe. You've got, um, uh, you've got sites further afield, like seven kilometers away or so five or six miles away, like Habet Zuvan Tepeze. And, yeah, it's, pr- it's pretty big. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's bigger than you think. It's not just one site you can walk about in. I mean, because the largest enclosure at Karahan Tepe is 23 meters or 75 feet. And that's only the main one that's been uncovered. There's a whole bunch of smaller ones in the general area. Um, but it stretches across the entire hill, across the valley, then they're realizing. And, yeah, it's pretty epic. And I think people are going to realize that Gebekli Tepe is bigger than people realize. That is amazing. The sites are as well. It's, it's pretty amazing. What is the significance, Hugh, of the winter solstice alignment at uh, Ketahan Tepe? Yeah, that's one thing that really stunned myself and J.J. Ainsworth. We um, had a fascination with archaeoastronomy for a long time, and a, a series of events led us to, um, to be there for... Winter solstice in 2021, uh, like December the 20th, it was at the time, and we discovered this remarkable alignment. So there's a whole stone which is like almost carved out of the bedrock between the main enclosure and the pillar shrine, where all these upright pillars are carved with the bedrock and this head sticking out, which has got serpent scales and an open mouth on it, which is three times the size of a human head. <clears throat> and what they what we found was is that. Ten minutes after sunrise, the sun would light would beam through the hole and l- illuminate the stone head precisely, and it would last. And the, the, the kind of as the sun moved across the sky, the light would come in at a slightly different angle and illuminate more of the stone head, and it would illuminate it for 45 minutes. Wow, that's amazing! So, clear, so clearly, this was designed for this purpose to mark the winter solstice doesn't work at any other time of year. The light only comes through and hits the head at that time of year, the most extreme uh, southerly point of the sun in the year, you know, going up to Christmas almost. And so that really stunned us. And we did uh, some extra research on that, and myself, JJ, and also with Andrew Collins and um, Rodney Haley helped us. And we realized if you go back to the time of construction, which we're talking, the date of Karahat Tepe goes back to 11,400 years ago. Hugh, in addition to the winter solstice alignment you discovered, you also found some hidden geometry and ancient measurements there. Tell us about that. Yeah, at Gobekli Tepe and, and at Karahat Tepe, we have found some very interesting uh, research, actually. Because uh, I've been studying the stone circles. I've written a book about this, obviously, uh, in Britain. You know, this is, these were, and, and Alexander Tom, who was a Scottish engineer, discovered multiple, up to eight different, very specific geometries in the stone circles here. But when I applied that to Gobekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe, we came up with some remarkable, well, coincidences. 
Um, and we found that each of the so far um, excavated enclosures at Quebecli Tepe, uh, B, C, and D, the three different enclosures, we found the same geometries as we're finding in British Stone Circle. We even found one of the geometries of enclosure D is the same as Nabta Playa in Egypt, which is a stone circle found in the southern, very southern edge of Egypt towards Sudan. And, um, and this is what's called an egg-shaped circle type 1. It's almost like a kind of odd egg shape, but it's constructed using Pythagorean triangles. We also found in enclosure C a flattened circle modified type B, and also a possible flattened circle type D for enclosure B. And so it, it gets pretty interesting when you start looking at um, all the different intricacies of these sites. And this kind of information should not have been around at this time. Further research has been done by some uh, Israeli archaeologists, Avi Gopher and Gil, Hack Gil Hackley, and they found also, this is published in an academic paper, that the, 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 the three main enclosures create a perfect equilateral triangle with various geometries and um, associations with it. We even found, when we applied this, my friend Adam Tetlow and I found some remarkable um, numbers coming out as well. We found ancient measurement systems encoded within the site, such as the Sumerian foot, the Persian foot, the Royal Egyptian foot. We've even found the megalithic yard, which is a measurement found in British stone circles, which is 0.83 meters or 2.72 feet. So this all suggests that the origins of this geometry, this ancient metrology, and this orientation was this was really first done at sites like Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe. Um, and so what does this mean? This means potentially they had an understanding of the size and shape of the Earth. And so they may have even been measuring the Earth. And when you start looking at things like um, Enoch's stories in the Book of Enoch, mm -hmm. um, he talks about taking cords and going off to measure and things like this. And so it kind of all starts, you know, you might have this realization that all this information that's encoded within like the pyramids, the stone circles of Britain and other places originated at sites like Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe. So it really is quite astonishing. What fascinates you the most to you about these sites? Well, I think, I think part of what I've just been mentioning is we're finding all these anomalies that shouldn't be there. I mean, one of the other things that that also fascinates me, as you know, but I've talked about it before, is earth grids and earth energy and things like this. And they've even found um, inside enclosure D, the main enclosure at Quebecli Tepe, some remarkable uh, acoustics and also uh, a, a magnetic anomaly at the center of enclosure D, like a spiraling magnetic anomaly. And this was actually found when they were studying the acoustics of the sites as well. And, uh, and to find a site this old that's built upon a magnetic anomaly harks back to all the, all the research put forward by John Burke and Kaj Halberg in their book Seed of Knowledge, Stone of Plenty, where they claimed that the placement of seeds at specific spots in ancient sites would charge them up as though the site was designed to be a seed charging station. But then when you plant them, they grow much stronger and quicker. And we must remember that the sites in this part of southeast Turkey, this is where agriculture developed and began after the construction of these sites, not long after. So was there some kind of remarkable innovation that took place here where they were utilizing, even way back then, the magnetism of the earth to charge their seeds and grains and actually develop agriculture? Now, this is quite a, a kind of far-out theory, but this could be the case. Years ago, Hugh, I had heard that Gobekli Tepe might even have been a landing spot for rockets. What do you think of that possibility? Yeah, there's been, yeah, there's been a lot of interesting uh, theories put on, put on these sites, that's for sure. Um, now, when you look at the style of these sites, one of the first, a lot of people say this, when they first see it, they can't believe ancient hunter-gatherers could do this, could create this site. The, art, uh, the artistic expression is very abstract. It's very bizarre. It looks almost alien. And this is what 
is has really got people kind of um, talking about that as a possibility. I mean, it's been on, we've been on ancient aliens talking about this, for instance, trying to get our head around it and trying to understand this. I mean, one of the statues that was discovered some years ago called the Kalisic statue, which was found further north, looks like an alien from the alien film franchise. It actually looks like one. The head it kind of goes way back. It's got like a grinning kind of teeth, gnarling teeth on it. And, uh, and people have compared it to Alien. And so I find that, you know, quite intriguing. It is truly remarkable, isn't it? It is. I mean, all, all, what is coming out of the ground there just is like an anomaly. Because they were all deliberately covered up, even the civilizations that came through the area, like the Sumerians, the Hittites, the Romans, etc., didn't even know they existed. And so they were almost, you know, only now are we, are we getting this. So this be, it's almost like a missing segment of history for the last 10,000 years that's been hidden. And so we're just starting to get our head around it now, thanks to all the uh, excavations that are taking place. Truly remarkable. Now, the, the stones that are there, are they cut like perfect, like there's no abrasion? Yes. There's, yeah, the, the stonework is astonishing, yeah. I mean, when you uh, have, a, have a look up close, you can see that they've almost polished, it's almost polished some of it as well. It, it look, it's very strange. I mean, you don't expect that. I mean, they're working with this quite tough limestone, this quite firm, high-quality limestone mainly, but there's also basalt they're using on some of the stone plates and some of the artifacts, some different materials. But, yeah, I mean, the quality of the stonework, you, you almost can't see the uh, tool marks or anything like that. And the fact that they were kind of creating such precision artwork. And some of the artwork, you know, if you look in the enclosure, see there's a sp particular kind of creature crawling down. It looks like it's crawling down the front of this thin T-pillar. It's, it's carved in 3D high relief. And so, who, I mean, where did they develop all this from? I mean, there's not much evidence before that. There's a few little places like Cortic Tepe and Bonchok Lutala where they were doing some stonework of a similar style. But this is it's like a high-level, sophisticated culture uh, were creating this from scratch. And you think about 3D relief carvings. You've got to carve away everything outside it to leave what's there. So just you've got to think kind of it's such a... Um, peripheral way that is absolutely astonishing all around. Are there any other structures like this in South America or North America? Any similarities? Well, you can compare um, You can compare a lot of um, what's being found there, especially if you're looking at some of the statues and the T-shaped pillars, because we must remember that T-shaped pillars are like anthropomorphic, so they're kind of partly human. Now, the, the top of the T-part is like an abstract blank head, there's arms coming down the side, there's hands touching the navel, they're wearing these belts, like with H's on, and this has been compared to many other cultures, like we find, like we see the hands on the navel in the statues, the Moai statues of Easter Island, for instance. We also find similar things at sites like Tiwanaku and Puma Punku for it as well, similar types of statues. And so, and also, we must remember that... Um, the name of Gobekli Tepe really means pot belly or navel hill. And Easter Island as well, the tradition there is that that's the navel site. That's the kind of center site. And yet they all, and then they all have hands touching the navel. And so these similarities are like possibly a massive coincidence because officially Easter Island is a much later culture. But maybe not. Maybe there was a much earlier civilization that many researchers have been putting forward as a theory. And you can look around the world, you start looking at places like Sulawesi in Indonesia, even some of the statues on some of the islands of Japan, um, and later sites in Europe, you find similar ideas kind of being spread. And that now all these sites have been discovered in southeast Turkey. Suddenly it all comes clear where many of these ideas came from. What does your gut tell you, Hugh, in terms of why these things were built? Yeah, I think these were built, partly I think these were built because um, it was like they were wising up. They were kind of being inspired by something going on. And it was, a, it was like a group effort to bring all their knowledge and wisdom 
and innovation into one place, one area, and to then become become like a teaching space for this to then uh, develop. And it became a legacy. And I think they were recording all their knowledge from thousands of years of hunter-gathering, going back to possibly Paleolithic times, and placing it in one spot. And I really believe a lot of their inspiration... Um, there's a big question mark over this, but I think a lot of their inspiration may have come from the ingestion of uh, mind-altering substances that they were kind of uh, hmm. experimenting with at the time. This is just one uh, one idea. It's like the kind of Terence McKenna idea. Graham Hancock spoke about this. But when you start looking at the proof that's coming out that they were brewing beer there, the earliest beer, which is interesting in its own way, which is a slightly mind-altering substance, but then they found, they found at other places actually earlier than this that when barley is brewed in a certain way to make beer, ergot can actually be a byproduct of this and this is the substance that is very similar to LSD. Now, I know this sounds kind of crazy but Weird. this is a genuine thing that's actually being discovered. At, not Agabekli Tepe yet but certainly at other sites um, in Israel that they're even older that they were brewing beer and the byproduct was um, something that was uh, rather psychedelic. Could this have been an entertainment area where perhaps they had it full of tents and things like that uh, on the top of it? Well, yeah, I mean, the, st the structures themselves, the enclosures, are quite large, and they're definitely designed for, um, for like, ceremonies, for entertainment, for performance, dancing, possibly, as well. And so I think there's an element of that with these sites. I don't think they're all, like, kind of uh, morbid ceremonies or rituals. I think it's, it was a kind of innovation center. People were celebrating. They were kind of having fun. You know, they were doing all these things, uh, as well as learning and teaching and things like this. And so I think, um, I think there's an element of that. And you can actually see that. I mean, you look at the shape and size of some of these enclosures. They're massive. You get hundreds of people in them. And, and the evidence now... They've done a lot of research on acoustics. Um, our good friend Andrew Collins has done some research on this because they're very elliptical shaped in, in a general sense. And so this, he did some analysis of the specific um, shapes in relation to acoustics and found that they are very resonant with human, the human voice and also with infrasound if they were banging drums and things like this which you can reach altered states with as well and so there's quite a lot of uh, other research that have backed this up um, uh, suggesting that may have been the case so I think there's more to it I think these sites were multi-purpose I think that's the, that's the key thing here Do you think it was a super civilization out there? Certainly do, yeah that's, that's one of the terms that I've come, I've come to associate with this culture, because if you put it in perspective, this is a huge area. We're talking, you know, Gebekli Tepe and Karen Tepe are two sites out of 12 which are being investigated now, okay? And, but there's potentially double or triple that amount. And the area stretches for 200 kilometers or about 125 miles wide. And so, if more sites are being discovered and they're, they're realizing that some of the other sites they haven't even started excavating yet could be larger than Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe. And so this, is, so this to me is like the first ever super civilization on the planet. And it's going to rewrite history. In the next few years, it's all going to blow up and, and people are going to go, oh my God. And all the history books have now got to be rewritten already. And that's before, you know, the rest of the sites are properly uncovered. Um, and I think you've got innovate, such innovation there with the astronomy, the things like acoustics, the geometry, the stone working techniques, uh, the layout of the sites, the, the kind of geodetic system as well. All the sites are kind of built in relation to each other over great distances. And I think there's just something remarkable um, happening there going way back almost 12,000 years. So, yes, I believe this is the world's first super civilization. Does Stonehenge look primitive next to Gobekli Tepe? Stonehenge is, uh, doesn't have the 3D relief carvings we find at Gobekli Tepe. Stonehenge is pretty cool. I mean, it's, um, it's got the stones there. A lot of them are carved and shaped into that kind of um, system that we see there where we have the lintels on top of the uprights. 
and the blue stones have some intricate kind of niches and carvings and, and kind of things like that on them. But when you look at Gobekli Tepe, it's almost like it, it, it seems like it was built after Stonehenge because it seems like that's the way the kind of evolution of design went, but it's the other way around. It's almost like the best stuff came first, out of nowhere almost. And so you can compare it to Stonehenge because the size of the enclosures, each one, you know, the larger ones anyway, are close to the size of Stonehenge. And I think there's actually possibly connections. I mean, you start looking at the geometry and the ancient measurement systems of Stonehenge, and we're finding the same systems in place at Gebekli Tepe. Hugh, it must be fascinating to discover all these incredible, incredible sites. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty mind-blowing. There's uh, several more are kind of under excavation right now in the, the region around Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe. Um, I mentioned a couple. One of them is called Saybirch, which is a fascinating site that was in the news last year because they found this kind of enclosure that appears to be an elliptical enclosure that's carved out of the bedrock. And on one edge of the bench, the panel, has this kind of man kind of holding his phallus with these animals carved on either side of him. And this is thought to be the world's first narrative scene where it's kind of describing a story, although it could have astronomical, astrological significance because the name Sayburch, S-A-Y-B-U-R-C, is really interesting because Say means counting, and Birch, B-U-R-C, the little thing coming off the sea, means sign of the zodiac, and Birch, B-I-R-C in Kurdish, means tower or watchtower. And so even the names of these sites could be encoding what they were used for in prehistoric times. Elaborate a little bit more, too, on the Book of Enoch and what it might have said. Well, yeah, there's some interesting stories in that because they, they talk about this time and this angel Uriel, who was like one of the watchers, um, who was like... Um, these elite kind of beings from you know the ancient world and um, Enoch was said to have been taken away by these watchers to these different lands and taking cords and going off to measure and also he, they describe these watchers as having these skill sets of like astronomy the stars the landscape you know geography um, also different things like working with stone, working with metal and other such things. And these all seem to match skills that are evident at sites like Gobekli Tepe and uh, Karahan Tepe. And so, you know, is there a connection here, especially when we're talking about going off to measure, because we're now finding measurement systems and geometry encoded within these sites. It's truly remarkable. It, it really is. Would you love to have been in a time machine, Hugh, to go back that far? Oh, that would be fascinating, wouldn't it? To see these see these sites as they were in their prime would be spectacular. Now, fortunately, we've got at the uh, Chandlerfer Museum, which is temporarily closed due to flooding earlier this year, they've actually got a reconstruction of Enclosure D from Gobekli Tepe, and it is amazing. And once you get inside it, you realize the magnitude, the kind of temple, almost cathedral type nature of these, you know. And so that's the only chance you're really going to get to be like inside one of these enclosures because they're very restrictive. You can't go right inside them if you're, unless you're one of the archaeologists working there. Um, and so, yeah, they are very, very impressive. And that's the closest thing you're going to get to time traveling is to get a reconstructed version of the site. Why does it seem like all these sites are buried? Yeah, I mean, they, the, the fact that they're burying them, this is, this is a big debate that's come out recently because, because they were appear to be reconstructed and repaired almost. Um, some people have suggested they were deliberately buried. This is what Klaus Schmidt said a long time ago. And now the recent archaeologists claim, well, actually, it could have, they could have caved in over time because as more constructions were built up around them, they kind of collapsed. I think it's probably a little bit of a mixture of both, especially at Gobekli Tepe, whereas Karahan Tepe certainly appears to have been kind of decommissioned, almost ritually damaged, uh, and then buried. Then buried. So why they buried them, we don't know. But what, the fact they did do that is brilliant today because we're getting preserved sites that have been preserved for thousands of years. If they were exposed to the elements all that time, there'd be nothing left. 
And so, because it's limestone, so, you know, thank God they were buried because we're now getting to see them in sometimes in pristine conditions, some of the statues, some of the artifacts that are coming out. And with the new discoveries that have just been made, that have been all over the, the internet, all over the, the, the media, they found remarkable new statues at Karahan Tepe, a new enclosure with giant tea pillars. They found this remarkable boar statue at Gebekli Tepe, which they found has red, black, and white paint pigment on it, which means, well, actually, were these then painted these sites? It's, it's put in a whole other perspective into the mix. Let's go to the phones, Hugh. Let's go to John, truck driving in Ohio to get us started. Hey, John, go ahead. Hi, George. Hi, Hugh. I hi. Know hi. I know we're talking about, like, buildings and sites, but we haven't, I haven't heard anything about the, uh, the crystal skulls that emanate the power. I don't know how many they were, but they were found in different places, and they, too, were, I think, buried as well. Is there, uh, is there an alien beginning on those, or were they created here on Earth, maybe Atlantis? or And do they really have power in them? What do you know of the crystal skulls, You Anything? Yeah, I used to be fascinated by crystal skulls, actually, but uh, they haven't found any at Gebekli Tepe, just in case you were wondering. Um, but they have found uh, other beautiful artifacts there. But, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a big story about them. There's actually one not far from me in the British Museum as well. Um, I think the most compelling one is the Mitchell Hedges skull, which is quartz. Uh, it was found yes. in the tomb, a site I've been to in Belize. And uh, they found a smaller skull at Monte Alban as well in a grave there. So they are certainly, some of them are certainly ancient. Um, the stories associated with them are covered in the book, The Mystery of the Crystal Skulls, which I highly recommend. And you can, you can get all the answers from that. But, yeah, they're very mystical, very powerful uh, objects. And uh, when people are close to them, they give off some kind of energy, don't they? That's what I've heard, yeah. I mean, uh, I've actually seen a few myself. And, uh, yeah, some people say they, they're, like, um, you know, imbued with kind of magic. And I think even some of the artifacts from Gebekli Tepe have kind of, they are imbued with some kind of power. I think, the, you know, people like, you know, the Mayans involved in, with these skulls, for instance, and also the builders of Gebekli Tepe, these were kind of, you know, shamanic people. They were kind of magicians and sorcerers, and they could give power to objects. And I think some of the stuff that's coming out of the ground um, is certainly kind of has that power, but, you know, we just we don't, we don't get access to them uh, until they end up in museums. West of the Rockies, Craig's with us in Chilliwack, Canada. Welcome to the show. Hi, Craig. Hello, uh, George. How are you doing? Great. I hope you are, too. I am fine. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Newman, I, I had a couple of questions, and I don't know. You mentioned crop circles earlier. Um, why do crop circles always happen in wheat fields? And it, have they ever had like a crop circle that's half, and then the other half is like in a pond or a pool of water? And then the other question was, uh, you know, a lot of people seem to think that uh, Gobeki Tepli was buried, uh, was washed over by water, and uh, and the uh, monoliths there were covered in sand and dirt that way. Do you, what do you think of that? Okay. Um, yeah, crop circles. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, there, you no, know, you do get some examples actually where they're kind of um, there's half a crop circle and, it, and the other half kind of vanishes into a, a road or a kind of hedge and things like this. So, um, so yeah, so you do get that sometimes. Yeah, and I mean they may appear. They might, you know, they might <laughs> they might be appearing all the time, like you know, in the middle of neighborhoods but you can't sort of see them because they're just houses in the way so who knows i mean uh they found them in ice they found them in sand they found them in mud things like this so um yeah they're certainly a very odd phenomenon as for uh, gebekli tepe being sort of uh flooded if you like i mean there are kind of uh some people suggest that the biblical flood was during the era of Gebekli Tepe going back nearly 12,000 years. Um, but no, but th th that was one of the early theories, actually. But now I think they've done enough analysis to know that there was a deliberate kind of burial and, a, and possibly a collapse at part of Gebekli Tepe. And so um, there's no real evidence for water there like you find perhaps at the Sphinx of Egypt and so forth. But, um, you know, only a few of this, only a small percentage of these sites have been uncovered to evidence of that may come forth. Hugh, what's your guess on how they move the blocks of stone? 
how they move the stone. This is a good question because some of the stones are quite a few tons. Now, luckily, they quarried them quite close to the site. Now, and also, I'm quite a fan of giants, and so I, I think giants were involved in it as well. But also, you know, cause if you go back into the, the old text, they talk about giants. But also, there's, I believe that these ancient people who were very tuned in, very shamanic, they could, I think they had powers. I think they, they had, like, psychic powers, they had tele, telekinetic powers as well. So uh, it could be one or all of these things. Sound residents, they had some way. They had some kind of knowledge, didn't they? Certainly, yeah, with acoustics as well, yeah. Dramatic. Next up, let's go to Doc in Petaluma, California. Hey, Doc, welcome. Hey, thanks, George. Hi, Hugh. I got a question. Um, was there any kind of uh, writing or script on the uh, on the sites at all? Yeah, there is actually. Yeah, there's um, some very interesting symbols have been found at uh, Gebekli Tepe. And there's been some work done by my partner, J.J. Ainsworth, um, but also Dr. Mano uh, Savzida and Robert Schock have been looking at some of the symbols as well. And we feature that, I feature that in the new book, actually. And it appears to be there's like a Hittite, ancient Hittite script, which goes back, you know, four or 5,000 years um, in Turkey. It's like Anatolian script. And some of the symbols are the same as what you find at Gebekli Tepe, although this Gebekli Tepe is 8,000 years older than that script. Um, and they claim to have found the name of God. You know, there's certain symbols, ages, mm. different chevrons and other such things. There's also carvings found on the top uh, bedrock at Karahan Tepe, which people haven't been able to decode. And so it could be the first, very first language attempts be put down in some kind of script at Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe. Hugh, wasn't the Sphinx buried too when they found it? Yeah, that was that was certainly buried. Yeah, they, it was just like the head sticking out of the ground, wasn't it? Um, I think that because it's sand there, it blows around. And yeah. Like that. It's, a, it's a little bit different to uh, um, southeast Turkey, which is much more rocky. Um, so it's harder for nature to uh, cover over these sites. Brendan's with us in Austin, Texas. Hey, Brendan, go ahead. Hey, thank you, George and Hugh. Uh, sure. The Mexican pyramids, and much of it's still unexcavated. You'd think that we'd have dug it all up, but we haven't. And I was talking about megacities last night, and there's this ancient megacity in Durinku, Turkey, and one in Poland that's had 30,000 people and their animals underground. But uh, I have two questions. Uh, Hugh, how many years have you been working in the ancient astronaut world? Uh, yeah, I've been I've been at it for a while, probably uh, uh, twenty twenty five years, something like that. I guess uh, I've been fascinated. I mean, since I was actually since I was a kid, um, I've been fascinated. I used to subscribe to this magazine called The Unexplained, and so I was really into UFOs and uh, the paranormal. Okay, perfect. Stuff. We're very young. Uh, with the AI that's coming in, how do you think the AI will change ancient astronaut and crop circle research in another five, ten, or twenty years? That's my first question. And the second one, that beer wine, the ergot wine that you were talking about, yeah. do you know if that causes ergotism? Because that causes, you know, their gangrene and their limbs to fall off in like a slow death. Was it like a gamble or was it safe to drink like ayahuasca? I think I think it was a bit of a gamble. <laughs> I would bet that too. That's right. And they, and they came across it um, kind of accidentally. Um, but But we know that, you know, you're looking at that kind of realm, then we know that you know certain types of mushrooms would be growing. We know that the grasses out there were rich in DMT, the acacia grass, and things like this. Um, and so, yeah, so um, that, that that could well be the case that they accidentally kind of made these that them kind of discoveries. And he wanted a little know about artificial intelligence tied into some of this. Yeah, I'm not sure about that, really. I'm not sure. I mean, I mean, if you're talking about like decoding what all these mean, then that that could be uh, could be really intriguing. Yeah, I'm, I'm really not sure where that's going to lead in relation to these uh, particular subjects. Mayette is in New York. Hello there. Yes. Hey. Good morning. Excellent. Excellent program. Uh, Hugh, I have a point of clarification and a two part question, and I will listen over the radio. Um, first of all, uh, expand on and clarify what you meant by Neolithic Revolution. I want to also know whether you have considered 
or use remote viewing and or dowsing, including the pendulum and, you know, the, the regular fork, forked uh, uh, branch in deciphering different aspects of all of this, of all these sites, including uh, its developers and builders. And the last part is um, uh, George mentioned giants. You referenced giants in your work and research. I got a book um, from a regular guest, Steve Quayle, and I mm-hmm. hope you're familiar with that picture of that giant man. And George might know exactly more precisely what his height was because he was huge and he was dwarfing um, uh, two, you know, ordinary sized men that were almost like below his knees. And if you have my questions, um, and so glad, George, you and, and Tommy are back safe and had a, a great event. I'll listen over the radio. Thank you. Yep, and the giant was about 12 feet tall, they say. But uh, what do you know about Neolithic revolutions? Yeah, basically the Neolithic revolution is uh, what are really archaeologists and historians call the transition from hunter-gathering to agriculture um, in the area of what's called the Fertile Crescent in the kind of Middle East. You know, this is a whole kind of area where it all kind of developed. Originally it thought it developed in Jericho, in, in like Israel, Palestine area, and, and then developed from there. But now they're realizing it was um, actually closer to Gebekli Tepe, you know, the kind of Karakadag Mountain and other areas. And so where the first wheat, barley, and crops were being experimented with. And if you, you mentioned dowsing and... Um, and remote viewing, yeah. Remote viewing, geomantic techniques, things like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I'm fascinated by dowsing, and we've we've had, uh, you know, we, we've been dowsing out there myself and others. And we found energy lines. The fact that this magnetic anomaly, the spiraling magnetic anomaly, is found in the enclosure D is absolutely fascinating. That was actually found with sophisticated scientific equipment, and so that really solidifies the fact that there's something energetic was going on at these particular sites. And I think there was uh, one other question. I've completely forgotten what that is. Well, she wanted to know about the height of the giants, which I mentioned was 12 feet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as, as George mentioned, yeah, the, the giants, I think, are prevalent as well, uh, were prevalent in that area. You look at the, even, even in the Book of Enoch, you look at, you know, the biblical stories, this is the region, all this kind of stuff was happening with the spread of the Nephilim coming out of the Bible lands as well. Hugh, is Turkey open to people investigating these structures, or are they pretty restricted? It's, it's a bit of both. I mean, you, you can go there. They're encouraging tourism. And so, um, you know, we, we run tours out there regularly. But we tend to go, we go there uh, for research and obviously with the tours as well. And they kind of they are open to it now because they want people to be going out there. They want uh, people to feel comfortable visiting they're allowing access to some of the sites. Now, you can't go right inside the middle of the sites or anything. You know, you can't do that. They're, they're very, because they're still excavating. So they have to protect sites. They have to protect it from looters. There's very high-level security there with army people kind of managing the sites. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a very nice place to visit. You know, you can get to these sites. You know, like, I think someone mentioned Darren Kuyu, the underground city as well. Um, and I, there's a good chance that the underground cities of Cappadocia may have occurred just after the end of when Gebekli Tepe and Karahan Tepe were finishing. Um, and they actually went underground for some reason, you know, perhaps because of the climate or solar flares or something like this. What other sites could there be that we haven't discovered? So it's all speculation here. But do you think there are other sites that are uncovered somewhere? Yeah, I think so. I think they're, they're finding more things um, in, in many different parts of the world. I think the LIDAR scanning technology is uh, revealing that. In the last couple of years, they found um, numerous, nearly, what, 480 Olmec and Mayan potential sites in Mexico and Guatemala, for instance. I mean, that is an astonishing number. And I think if they apply that kind of scanning technology to southeast Turkey, I think they're going to be in for a big surprise. Well, let's go back to the phone calls. This segment's going to fly by. International Line, Don's in Alberta, Canada. Hey, Donald, go ahead. 
Hi, George. Hi, you. Um, speaking of time travel, I was actually texting in some information on uh, how to uh, do time travel, but uh, getting to the um, – um, I was looking online to see how hard it was for somebody to find the information on it, but the plans are very simple. Um, anyway, so getting into uh, Stonehenge in England. Now, each stone is within half an inch of degrees, minutes, and seconds. They understood hyperdimensional physics. Um, they, it also told them, because there's one in Florida, that uh, that dinosaur Richard C. Hoagland dug up way back in the beginning of time. Anyway, the... Um, but my question is, is, is it possible that these sites were all built at the same time? And the other thing was that um, Stonehenge, it doesn't activate all at the same time. There's been reports of when people go in there, they lose like a day or two of time, and they walk out and they, like, they've lost, they think they were in there for 10 or 15 minutes. So these sites don't always activate at the same time. Like there's certain times when the energy, the natural earth energy lines up and activate the site. So I was just wondering if there was, like, what the connection is of, of all these sites and the mathematics involved and uh, whether they, the people that built uh, Gobek Tepe understood hyperdimensional physics or were, there's too much to uncover and we're just not there yet to, to understand. Where were they built, you Differently times or all about the same? Well, that's a good question. I mean, because, you know, interestingly, at Stonehenge, they found these giant wooden post holes made of pine um, that go back 10,000 years. And these are located uh, just next to Stonehenge, within like 50 yards of the actual stone circle. But then apparently the stone circle wasn't built for another 5,000 years after that. And so that, that's an anomaly at Stonehenge. Um, and yeah, there, there could, be a, it could be a case for that, that many of these sites could be much, much older. And as you said, the, the, the knowledge and information and the physics encoded within Stonehenge, we're finding now similar things in southeast Turkey, in Gebekli Tepe, Karahan Tepe. And I think, you know, more needs to be uncovered to get more details about what you're talking about. But certainly, you know, just the fact that we're finding number sciences, geometry, metrology already at Gebekli Tepe means there's something profound going on there. What about the time lapses? Are there any there? You get this, I mean, you get that with magnetic anomalies, and there is one at Gebekli Tepe, but, you know, I, I, know I've, I know people who've had direct experiences at Stonehenge where they've had, um, it seems to just, like, fizzing like, with, like, this electric charge, for instance, you know, where they've been there and they, they've had to walk away from it just to kind of feel normal again. And so, yeah, it's, it feels random when these things happen, but maybe it's not. Maybe there's something going on. Maybe they're aligned to certain things in the cosmos and things occur. But, yeah, if you look, if you trace back, there are stories of people kind of um, vanishing from Stonehenge. There's UFO reports, strange lights have been witnessed, electric shocks off the stones. And so, yeah, there's something very strange going on. Up next, Sean is with us from Stockton, California. Sean, thank you for holding. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to focus on the ancient stonemasons. Uh, you've got the modern Masonic order, which is talked about on the show, that started in Europe, and it teaches that the ancient trade of stonemasons kept the craft of stonemasonry secret within their fraternity. Have you been able to identify how the trade would have evolved in the building of Asian structures and when it had, may have become an organized trade? Thank you. Well, we get this, uh, I mean, the Egyptian mystery schools, I think, are where this kind of is said to have come from. But then if you look at, but as we've just been discussing, if you look at um, Egypt and you go back to the time of Nabta Player, which is like five to 6,000 BC, um, they were using the same geometries with specific astronomy in it. Um, and as we get at Gebekli Tepe. And so, you know, to, did it originally come from there? This is where everything kind of points back to. And so, if, if anything, you know, the, the real information, the real innovation 
would have occurred at places like um, Gebekli Tepe, Kerala Tepe, southeast Turkey. Um, it's hard to trace anything because the problem is is that they were covered over and literally forgotten about for nearly nine, ten thousand years. But we have found, I mean, it's something that Andrew Collins and, and some archaeologists have been doing. They found evidence of uh, what's called the Helwan Point, which is a, an Egyptian area, a certain type of um, arrowhead found. In generally in, in Egypt, that goes back, you know, ten, eleven thousand 11,000 years, they found evidence of some of those in some of the sites, specifically in Baliklagol area of Shan Lurfa, where they found Urfa Man statue. They found points there, which they date back to the similar era. So there is a connection, a lineage, a timeline between Gebekli Tepe, Egypt, going into these uh, Masonic traditions. Let's go to Mary in New Jersey now. Hello, Mary. How's everybody? Everybody's good. Um, Thank you. I have two little questions. Um, one is, where would their water supply come from? You know, their drinking water? Does it show evidence where they got their water? And the other one, I don't know if I have the place mixed up with something else. Is this are one of these places where if you're up in the sky, you can look down and they have like a drawing of a bird or whatever, and it was a runway? Is that the same place? No, that is in Peru. Those are those are the Nazca lines. Yeah, that's right. They're the Nazca lines. But the water thing is interesting because at, at specific sites like the Begli Tepe and Karahan Tepe, they don't have any running water nearby and no underground water. So they actually carve out these like bell-shaped caves directly into the ground and collect rainwater. They harvest rainwater um, for for these sites. And so I don't think these are domestic dwellings. These aren't where people live. These, these are ritual sites. These are innovation centers where people p- go on pilgrimage. But there are other sites in the area, like Navali Churi, there's uh, Kachianu, uh, there's a couple of other places. And they're all down by rivers and streams next to either the Euphrates or their tributaries or the Tigris. Some of the sites further uh, east have this. And they're located next to the actual water. And they're clearly different they're domestic sites and so um yeah so they did certainly if they couldn't be near a natural water source they would certainly collect water in these basins in these sites you how close are they to civilizations well if you look at karahan tepe i mean it is in the middle of nowhere i mean i mean it's a few i mean nowadays gebekli tepe is what 15 miles from Shanla for a major city in uh, southeast Turkey. It's actually the ancient Edessa. It's like the biblical city of Abraham. Um, and Karahan Tepe is like, what, 25 uh, miles south southeast of Channel Urfa. So currently, they're actually not really near civilization. And back then, they would have been even more remote. You know, there's like, uh, they, would, they would have been the civilization at the time. Josh is with us in Florida now. Hello, Josh. Go ahead. Hey, how are we doing? Uh, great, great show. Great guest. Um, Thank you. I thought, you know, if, if your guest ever heard about the Coral Castle here in uh, South Florida, and um, I'm not sure if he touched them um, already, also about um, ley lines and uh, if these sites um are all kind of connected. Throughout. All right, we'll talk about that. In uh, Homestead, Florida, there is a site called the Homestead, Florida, which is built yeah. by Edward Leed Skalnan, the late Edward Leed Skalnan, a little guy from Latvia who was able to move these structures, said he knew the secret of the pyramids, Coral Castle. Yeah, it's, it's an ama- I've been there. It's, it's an amazing place. Um, kind of, uh, like that is astonishing. That's like a... <clears throat> That's like a modern megalithic village. And so he, he somehow utilized the skills of the ancients into his construction. Rumors say he used some kind of magnetism combined with balance and certain techniques. And no doubt the ancients, you know, were doing similar things. Um, but, yeah, ley lines. And there were, yeah, we found a whole bunch of ley lines. We feature these in the new book, actually. Um, you know, between the sites there, they're dead straight alignments. Uh, we have quite a few... Uh, very cool examples. We have some even going all the way from Gebekli Tepe through some of the sites in the area um, uh, all the way to places like Karahunj in Armenia that stretch all the way to even Nam Madol in uh, Micronesia, like 7,500 uh, 
seven, sorry, 7,500 miles. And so we are finding extremely long ley lines. We're finding connections. There's a direct geodetic line between uh, Gebekli Tepe and uh, the Coricancha in the middle of Peru. And it's exactly um, 72928 miles which is uh, also the equatorial diameter of the Earth. So we're finding these geodetic distances between these major ancient capitals, which also both relate to the navel in their name, um, all over the world. And so it seems like Gebekli Tepe was the center of it all. Let's go east of the Rockies. Glenn is with us in Nashville, Tennessee. Hi, Glenn. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, this, this is such an interesting program tonight, George. I tell you, I could listen to this man for a couple of days. <laughs> Me too. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you about the pyramids. Uh, I have been in the, in the middle pyramid, and the steps going down are very narrow. But in, you know, in, the, in, the, in the chamber in the bottom, it was a tomb for the uh, king of Egypt. But uh, are there, are there uh, specific mathematical relationships uh, with the pyramid and, and other planets or, or uh, uh, some of the solar system uh, that he is familiar with? What can you say about the pyramids, Hugh? Well, yeah, I mean, the pyramids um, are utterly mind-blowing, you know, one of the, the last remaining um, wonders of the world, really. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you can't help but accept that that is one of the most remarkable things on the planet. I mean, when I first went there, the first thing I thought of was aliens did this uh, because it's so outrageous. And that some of the geometry, the whole kind of, the whole site itself kind of incorporates high-level physics, mathematics, geometry, number, metrology, and everything else you can think of. And But we, we are actually finding the the Egyptian cubit and the Royal Egyptian feet and things like this in Gebekli Tepe as well. And so we're finding the same number systems, the same information encoded. So does that suggest that the pyramids are older, that they're much, much older, um, like the, the age of the Sphinx, according to people like John Anthony West? Or is there a legacy that goes back to Gebekli Tepe where all these ideas started to be innovated? Okay, my friend, you stay safe out there, okay? Thanks, George. Thanks, George. <laughs> okay. I'm George Norris, somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM. We'll see you on our next edition. Until then, be safe, everyone. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.